Nikkei's unprecedented success has been somewhat of an anomaly. From being pioneers of live 2D technology with their previous game Destiny Child, now competing with the top docs in the gacha industry, I want to do a review of all the characters that came out before 2024, and also give a brief retrospective on all the events that the game has done so far. Since the game launched in late 2022, I'll also cover the first two months of content as well. Almost feels like yesterday that I've started playing for the exhilarating one-handed combat, and I want to see just how far the game has come. My name is Psyche, and let's review the highs and lows of Nikkei 2023. The game launched in early November 2022. I was not there for launch day, but I joined around a week later. It was interesting to see how they marketed the game. There were memes bombing left and right. I'm coming. The lore accurate tie ad that they took down, which really should have stayed up. The approach they took was strange, but it got people talking. And that's enough for me to give it a shot. The first banner of the game was Helm. I don't think she's top tier, but certainly one of my favorites. The first ever event was No Color ID, and I don't believe a lot of players were able to fully clear the hard mode unless you were playing daily from day one where you wailed. The event is available in the archive if you want to give it a look. There's no dedicated OST for it, they literally just used the shop theme, but whatever. The second banner in late November was Laplace. I would say she's an okay DPS overall. She fires a big laser beam, so that's pretty cool. The main gripe people had with the event was the minigame, where you would roll a dice and land on certain squares, and it would either reward or punish you. The problem was that the total amount of rewards were randomized, so it was possible to land on a couple unlucky streaks and lose out on bonuses. They kind of fixed it with Summer 1's version, but it still kind of feel bad to miss out. Next was the first Christmas event. Rupee was a bit of a bust, but Anne is used in PvP and certain one-shot teams. Now, something interesting about this event. The first time it aired, the event was not voiced, but one year later, when they added it to the archive, they went ahead and voice acted it. So if you're around for the first time, you can return to it and maybe enjoy the story for a second time, now that it's voiced. Anyways, this also marked the first time when I knew Shift Up had some competent writers, because the story was pretty good. Very strong end to the first two months of launch. The event also gave out Neve as a free SR, and one year later, last December, they added her to the event shop in case you missed it. Starting the new year of 2023, Modernia launched as the first pilgrim to be released past the game's launch. She was pretty hyped up. A Scarlet was really the only top-tier DPS that required little investment. And even now, Modernia has a rerun banner happening. She is a solid unit, but what wasn't solid was the event. Challenge mode wasn't a thing yet, and the story was just touches of fan service. It was also where the Helm skin came from, so I'm not exactly complaining. Next one in January was the Outer Rim event featuring the Exotic Squad, which is where Jackal and Viper released. Jackal is insane at PvP, except I don't cover PvP on this channel. Viper is not very good meta-wise, but certainly one of the most popular characters they released. In February was the Valentine Maid event. This introduced Coco and Soda. Both are quite niche and I don't see them being played too much, and the maids barely made any appearances after the event aired. I'm guessing they will release Aid this year, but hey, she's not the first to be stuck in NPC jail. I literally don't remember anything about the event, it was pretty forgettable if you ask me. Now I'm gonna be honest, the Chainsaw Man collab was a disaster. The lore was non-existent, the story was non-existent, Makima was non-existent, that's a huge red flag right there. It felt like having the Chainsaw Man name out there was the priority, other than creating a good event. The event also added abnormal gear into the game pool. The things that were good were the music, the limited raid boss, and here's the big one, they added an alternate skin to remove Makima's coat. This was the moment I realized that Shift Up was not your typical devs. They actually listened. Coming from playing Genshin and FGO for years, I was used to the player base being treated like a dirty rag. Generally, these player bases don't throw their fists in the air cheering for the developers, they just tolerate that their voices will probably not be heard and keep on playing. This was a first for me. Anyways, the first abnormal units we received were Himeno for the SR, Power and Makima for the SSRs. They're not that good, but I'm sure a lot of people got a copy just for collection's sake. Power is just average for doing damage, really missed the mark for a rocket launcher user, and Makima has a gimmick where she can stay alive for a little bit even after reaching zero health. I actually use Makima in my Altaisen special interception runs, but to be honest, you can just use noise. I never expected a collab event in a gacha game to be good, but this one mainly had lows rather than highs. After that, Biscuit was added into the game. I remember you built like an animal shelter in the story, but this one wasn't really memorable either. 
This kit can repair a cover that's completely blown out, so that's pretty cool. I did run her in the last solo raid, so I would say she's got uses. Pretty average event though. Sakura was added next, and this was the first look into the Circle of Underground Crime Syndicates. There was some fan service, and while Sakura isn't used much today, she does hard counter any wind code enemies, including being really good to counter the edgy Scarlets that will show up in PvP. Some players run her in Naltesen's Special Interception to make the fight easier, and I can see Sakura being better as time goes on. To this day, the event also introduced Moran, who at the time of editing this video actually came into the Nikkeipedia with the latest update. You can actually view her kit right now. So we can only presume that she's going to be the next unit released. On April 1st, we got a gag event where Shifty was playable. This event was non-canon, and Shifty will not become a normal unit in the gacha. But it does show the level of care the devs put into the game. It's just the right amount of silly fun and fan service, and you can clearly see that they knew what the players wanted. It's not exactly the most content-rich event, but it really shows that they created the event from a place of passion. Next event featured D, who belongs in a mercenary slash spy organization, and you infiltrate a company to gather intel. Now I don't believe D has had any involvement in the main story, but it was a cool concept. She doesn't see much use, but has a gimmick to fill up your burst gauge instantly when the level starts, for those critical fights. I did use her in the Chatterbox solo raid for my Snow White team, and it actually worked quite well. There's also Kay, who is currently stuck in NPC jail as well, though I don't see a lot of people talking about her, so I guess it's not a priority. Late April was the half anniversary event Overzone. This was the time I realized they had some really good writers at the team, because I enjoyed this event more than Red Ash. Everything about it was just perfect. The story was amazing, the minigame was amazing, the soundtrack, and the new pilgrim Dorothy, who gave birth to this majestic creature. If you ask anyone that's been playing long, I would not be surprised at all if they placed this event high in their top lists. It's even available in the event archive, so give it a look if you haven't already. Dorothy was the first support unit that did so much damage, it really makes you wonder if the class system even matters. She's a top tiered unit in my eyes, I run her all the time. I didn't make a guide since a lot of support units work the same way, just don't run any buffs that give max ammo count, you want these empty mag effects to trigger more often. This event also gave out Rei as a free SSR, though she does not get a debut in any Story War event until a bit later. Next event after the half anniversary was where the bunnies debuted. They actually have some main story relevance later, because their casino shows up on one of the campaign maps. It's a fan service heavy story, not that I really care, but it was also the first of the dual type units where you need both of them to work. These two also changed the meta in a pretty significant way. A lot of the best comfort teams run them. I may make a guide on the twins, but to be honest, supports don't really need guides. Something interesting I also want to point out is that during the event, there was another NPC called Rouge, who was a dealer that also works at the casino. If she ever gets released, then the bunny's same squad requirement would also technically be met by Rouge, as their kit only specifies that they need another unit from the same squad, not specifically the other bunny twin. So maybe we get a bit more flexibility when we use them, if she ever gets released. A far cry from the bunnies, Rosanna released next, and something interesting happened on my account right before the new year. I had every Tetra unit up to this point except for Rosanna and Blanc. I wasn't recording at the time, but I got a gold spark when rolling on the friend point banner, and it showed Tetra, and you can imagine the excitement on my face. Turns out I lost the coin flip, which meant Blanc was the only Tetra unit I was missing up until I got the SSR selector. So Rosanna, despite being really badass in the event, was less so in terms of power level. She's got a cool gimmick where she can hide from enemies. This is interesting to see in action, but the issue is that you can't do damage while she's hiding, and there's no level type in the game where it's an endurance to survive for a period of time and not focus on doing damage. But maybe that'll be useful someday, just not now. Next event was the first of the two Summer 1 events. Two limited summer units were added, being Mary and Neon. Mary leans more into a water code team, while Neon, well, people bashed on the devs for not understanding how game balancing works, because even though they buffed Neon after release, she was still just considered fairly average. They also kind of fixed the dice rolling minigame, you can still lose points if you're unlucky, but I didn't see any significant complaints about it this time around. Pretty average event if you ask me, but that's about to change. There were two events after this before part two of Summer 1. The first was the Funny Cat event, 
adding Nero into the game. I can't really comment as I don't have much experience using Nero, but she does count as a taunter, so that's something. I'm also happy to announce that Leona, who was previously stuck in NPC jail, will be the first to escape it in 2024. Aside from that, the story was super funny and wholesome, so definitely give it a shot in the archive. After that, it was Mast's debut. She works well with HP scaling attackers. I'm sure she'll get more value as time goes on, but the use case right now is a little limited. In the event, a new character called Chime also makes an appearance, which to my knowledge was the only time she appears before later in the main story. Slight spoilers there, I guess. In August, the majority of the month was taken up by part 2 of Summer 1. This event was fully voiced and was in my opinion one of the best events we've had. The story wasn't to the level of Overzone, but it was serviceable. The draw of it was first, the minigame was fast and challenging, and in my opinion should be the standard for them going forward. I just don't want to spend like 20 to 30 minutes completing my daily sword every time. There was a Kraken raid boss, the two new summer units, Helm and Anis, both surprisingly good, which in some cases is bad since people would have to wait until next summer for a rerun. Helm is a CDR unit in slot 2, which is actually quite valuable, and Anis being one of the best self-sustaining shotgun DPSs in the game. Now, what really sold me on this event was the attention to detail. The map would swap between a day slash night slash stormy cycle, and there would be distinct music tracks that play. There were fireworks at nighttime, Freema was contemplating some life choices, but you know, the map felt alive. And for me, that was enough to make the event memorable. From this summer event, they also gave out Anchor as a free SR unit. I hope they add this to the archive, because it was definitely one of my favorites. So this is where they really pick up with the banners that are being released. Right after Summer 1, it was the Nier collab, and it was also when I started this channel. This was the longest event so far, lasting for 4 weeks. Compared to the Chainsaw Man one, it was fairly good for a collab event. Both 2B and A2 were pretty decent additions. The story was not voiced, but it was serviceable that it was in theme for the Nier franchise. The minigame was also pretty cool, though the controls on PC were terrible. The soundtracks, while not being composed by the original Nier composer, was still a pretty good attempt at recreating the feel. And having somewhere to use abnormal gear was a breath of fresh air, though I think they should tweak the numbers for the drop chats. I definitely like 2B slightly more, as she scales with HP and allowed unconventional units to shine like volume and mast. They also gave out Pascal as the free SR, and is the only male unit in the game if you can even call a robot that. Overall, I would just say it was a good event. Way better than the Chainsaw Man collab at least. If 2B didn't damage your wallet enough, next event featured Marciana, who unexpectedly to this day is one of the most popular characters they've released. And lately, she's actually been seeing a rise in usage as there's actually no other Type 2 healer that works independently. With certain raid bosses demanding a healer, she's not bad at all in those cases. And if you're not playing her for meta, you're probably playing her for a different obvious reason. Her PS5. The event also finally gave spotlight to Rei, as well as Zwei and Ain, who are both in NPC jail at the moment. The next event continues the onslaught with Naga and Tia, both very influential support members for late game content against bosses. I remember throwing away $20 for 20 pulls and actually got Tia out of it. Would not recommend gambling, just stick to battle passes if you're a low spender. So the Tiga comp is one that I use very often and one you'll see a lot in my videos. They're extremely good, but I would say prioritize the bunnies if you can. Tiga realistically shines the most in bosses, but still is usable in normal content. It's an amazing addition if you have them, but I wouldn't say they are absolutely necessary or should take priority. The Halloween event gave a rebreather for everyone's wallets, as Kiri, you know, isn't exactly the best at supporting. She fits into the more niche type of buffing HP. So while maybe if they change the damage formula in the future, she will see more use. But for now, it was a skip for most people, as everyone knew that the first anniversary was coming up. If you don't see me make a guide on a character, it's either because there's nothing noteworthy to talk about, or I just didn't pull since they didn't seem good enough. The story was also pretty wholesome, a far cry from what is about to happen next. In early November, Red Ash was the anniversary event, featuring a prequel of the early Pilgrims. While I still liked Overzone's story a bit more, this one was also really good. There was a small debacle surrounding Red Hood's release. She wasn't exactly what she was advertised, but a week into the patch, she received a buff that allowed her to reach Godhood status. Red Hood was able to dethrone pretty much any of the previous DPSs when it came to ease of use and damage numbers. 
She does have a gimmick where she has all three of the burst types, but realistically people are gonna use her for the type 3. She is the ultimate cheat code to pretty much all content. Snagging a copy will make your life easier. But I understand pilgrims are quite rare, though I just want to state that she is really good and worth investing in. While we're at it, I thought the minigame that parodied Vampire Survivor was pretty fun, and they did say they're even adding it as a permanent mode. The only thing was that each run took a long time, and I didn't bother with getting that last achievement for the extra synchro slot. There was also a unique raid boss, Ultra, and was the first time I got the tier 3 border in solo raid. Again, the game world felt alive. There were all these mini-stories, the background and settings were changing, and they responded to feedback really quickly. Not as good as Overzone, but it's still a very solid event for first anniversary. In late November, Tove released as a shotgun support unit. I made a guide, she's oddly resource-hungry for a supporter, and while she's pretty cool in the shotgun niche, shotgun teams are just not that meta. Maybe this will change in the future, but for now, onto the shelf she goes. Last but not least, Christmas 2 was live for the majority of December featuring two limited units of Lumilla and Mika. We finally got a solid Waterco DPS, and while I did pull for Mika too, I didn't make a guide since I thought her debuff cleanse effect wasn't that noteworthy. It's unique for sure, but you're missing out on a lot of buffs if you run Mika instead of Leader or something. That Type 1 slot is just way too valuable to pass up, but I actually like this event, for the main story at least. The main criticism people had was that the commander was basically cucking himself in the minigame, but hey, doujins exist, so I don't really have a problem with that. They also gave unique gift items at the end, but I don't think I'm ever spending those. And so that concludes year one of Nikkei. Pretty influential year. Well, it's the only year we've had so far, but with the release of Edgy Scarlet, I'd say this upcoming 12 months is off to a good start. I love it when developers learn from any past mistakes and upscale the game to be better. Apart from the new content, if there's one thing I would like to see, is the buffing of any existing characters. It's always good to see more underdogs get more spotlight. And it's not something gacha games do on a large scale. But they have buffed characters in the past, so I don't think it's completely out of the question. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this year one review of Nikkei. And lastly, I do want to thank everyone for 10,000 subscribers. I'm looking for an eventful year of 2024. And as always, have fun with the game.